I think the most significant case I've worked on in my legal career is involved a man, a Japanese American man in Oakland, who refused to obey military orders that were aimed at Japanese Americans and Japanese during World War II. Uh, the orders required uh, Americans of Japanese ancestry to leave their uh, homes in the West Coast state and move essentially into imprisonment for indefinite confinement. Uh, the basis was their race, that we were at war with Japan and Japanese Americans were suspected as being disloyal. That justification was military necessity. Those people included 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of whom were American citizens. They were denied all due process rights, no right to notice of charges, no right to a hearing, no right to an attorney. And they included, you know, from a personal point of view, my family, my parents, my then one-year-old uh, brother, who was considered a national security threat. Uh, they were taken to some God-forbidden places in the country. They lived in horse stables, and they were moved to some of the nether reaches of this, uh, the United States. Three men stood up to challenge those orders. One included Fred Korematsu from Oakland, California. And uh, he argued that it was uh, discrimination to single out an entire ethnic group uh, without due process and take them away for indefinite confinement. He uh, lost his case. He appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And what, uh, okay, let's again. And the Supreme Court uh, failed Fred Korematsu. Uh, they uh, upheld his conviction uh, on basis of uh, very flimsy evidence. The Supreme Court had no evidence that Japanese Americans were guilty of espionage or sabotage, which is what was claimed. They had reports that uh, Japanese Americans were not dangerous, uh, that they should be taken to individual hearings rather than just uh, banished en masse. And yet uh, the Supreme Court upheld his conviction. Uh, he was terrifically disappointed because he had an abiding faith in the United States government. Two other men, Gordon Hirabayashi and Minoru Yasui, challenged their own uh, arrest and conviction in Portland and uh, Seattle. And they were also convicted, and their cases also went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had no evidence of the danger of Japanese Americans except for these innuendos, these hints, these half-truths, that were promulgated by the War Department and the U.S. government. Uh, there was no evidence of any es espionage or sabotage by Japanese Americans. No Japanese American was ever uh, accused or convicted of espionage or sabotage. And yet the Supreme Court had to find some basis for upholding these uh, uh, convictions. So it created this theory, the ethnic characteristics theory, that because of their Japanese uh, heritage and ancestry, they are more likely to be disloyal uh, and have a connection to the enemy, which was Japan. Of course, they didn't discuss Germans or Italians. They didn't discuss uh, Hawaii, where the largest group of Japanese Americans resided, where the Pearl Harbor attack occurred, where the largest American Pacific Naval Fleet was housed. So they conveniently overlooked those arguments and uh, despite the arguments put forward by Fred and Gordon and Min, their convictions were upheld. Forty years pass. Japanese Americans return to their homes deeply shamed, deeply damaged by the psychological uh, inferences or implications that they were, in fact, dis disloyal. They rebuilt their lives, tried to forget about what happened to them, and yet the uh, civil rights movement, in the late 50s, early 60s, ignited the imagination of an entire country, uh, including Japanese Americans. And the flame of that uh, movement impelled Japanese Americans and other, pe and other people of color to explore their history. And in exploring their history, Japanese Americans discovered that there was no real solid evidence to justify the imp their imprisonment. So. Uh, they started a movement called the Redress Movement. 
They, de they tried to extract and demand reparations and an apology from the United States government for what they perceived was a tragic injustice. Uh, and, and this movement took hold in the early 70s and continued on, you know, through, uh, through the 80s. But in the early 80s, a man named Peter Irons, professor, a lawyer, was in the archives with a Japanese-American woman, Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig. And w what they discovered was startling. It was remarkable. They found documents from the government's own files which uh, they found governments from their own files which showed that the United States officials had deliberately lied to the Supreme Court in order to win their cases at all costs. The arguments that they had made in the Supreme Court that Japanese were pro, 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 uh, pro, the arguments they made in the Supreme Court were that Japanese Americans had a pro propensity for disloyalty because of their racial characteristics, that Japanese were involved in espionage and sabotage, and that there really was no time to differentiate the loyal from the disloyal. The evidence the government actually had and suppressed from the Supreme Court was directly contrary to those uh, arguments. So what they had were official reports from the Office of Naval Intelligence uh, from a man named Curtis Munson, uh, in fact from the FBI, who uh, said that there was no reason to incarcerate the Japanese Americans en masse. They're no more disloyal than any other country to the arguments that Japanese Americans were a threat. But they also produced the arguments, memos by the lawyers who were advising the Supreme Court that were telling, excuse me, but they also uh, found documents by the attorneys that uh, warned their superiors that we are telling lies in the Supreme Court. We have an ethical duty to promote, pr uh, to uh, produce these documents. So we felt that we had some really strong evidence and we proceeded on a course of conduct. We, and so we proceeded to file a writ of error quorum nobis. It's Latin for uh, correcting and manifest injustice, which you, you which occurred years ago. And we brought cases in uh, San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland. And our strategy was really to uh, start in San Francisco, where we had the best panel of judges, and then secondly, uh, file in uh, Seattle. Immediately, if we got a bad judge, we try to delay the proceedings in San Francisco, move ahead in, in Seattle, and later on consolidate. Portland was throw up your hands and hope you got anything. But by chance and luck, and you know, lawyers usually don't uh, attribute luck to anything but bad luck when they lose a case, uh, we got uh, selected randomly uh, for Marilyn Hall Patel, who was a judge in the Northern District of California and one of the brightest, strongest, most courageous judges you could find. And we knew we. When we got, when she was selected, we had a good chance. Um, it was kind of funny because when we filed our petition, first they didn't know what quorum nobis was. They had to call in the chief judge. It was so rare. Then when we got the selection by computer, uh, the clerks know what's happening. And so when the name Marilyn Hall Patel came out, we were slapping high fives in the courtroom. We were exultant because we knew we had a chance. It was very undignified. On the other hand, we didn't care because now we had a chance. We brought these cases for several reasons. Obviously, one is to overturn the convictions of these three, three brave men. They were uh, ostracized for doing what they did, as many Japanese Americans did not want to rock the boat. Uh, and the wartime community you know, felt that the incarceration of justifies had, uh, uh, incar and the community in the United States thought that the uh, incarceration was justified. We also wanted to put a nail in the coffin of Korematsu, one of the worst decisions ever allowed to, to exist by sanctioning the imprisonment of 120,000 Americans, most of whom were citizens, without any due process. Uh, and a decision 
where the Supreme Court simply abdicated the responsibility, threw up their hands, and gave complete deference to the President of the United States without any evidence, which we now know was actually suppressed. Uh, and so we wanted to correct history as well. Uh, there were cynical people who believed, of course, there was something, uh, some substance to why we did this, uh, and yet the evidence we had proved that there was none. Uh, so with this mission, we felt this incredible amount of um, confidence. Of course, confidence comes from the great evidence we had, but we also knew what was done to Japanese Americans was absolutely morally wrong and that the precedent that we wanted to set would hopefully stop racial profiling in this country or at least give us an argument or a precedent to stop that. And as we proceeded through litigation, you know, the government offered Fred Korematsu a pardon. And Fred, uh, we took that to Fred. Fred said, I, don't, I, I reject that, I don't want a pardon because it admits your guilt. It just does away with the penalty. Uh, then a week later, the, the government asked uh, us if we would consider a pardon for innocence. And I asked the lawyer for the government, we, we researched this. What is, what is a pardon for innocence? He goes, oh, we just made it up. Well, we took that to Fred. And Fred was actually outraged. He and his wife, Catherine, said, we do not want to accept a pardon. If anything, we should pardon the government. We were thrilled with his willingness to fight because... Uh, the stakes were pretty high, not just the legal cases we were brought, but they were brought in the middle of this whole redress movement that I mentioned, where Japanese Americans were seeking from Congress, uh, they are trying to extract an apology and monetary compensation. And the opponents in, uh, in Congress were arguing, well, wait a minute, in 1943 and 1944, the court upheld what was done to Japanese Americans in the uh, Korematsu, Hirobayashi, and Yasui decisions. The proponents did not have a rationale or a, an ar a argument against that until we get our hearing in the court of, uh, Northern District of California. And in that hearing, I started out by arguing that uh, we are here today to seek a measure of justice denied to Fred Korematsu and the Japanese people some 40 years ago. And I proceeded to argue why statements of fact and uh, of law were absolutely necessary uh, to heal, not just heal the wounds, but rectify the manifest injustice that occurred to Fred Korematsu. It, it was kind of an interesting hearing because it was packed with reporters, uh, many Japanese Americans who wanted to have their first day in court because they never had one, attended. And uh, as we gave our arguments, Fred eventually uh, was given the chance to state his position. And he said that he, if when he first came to this court, he came in handcuffs. And that he is doing this, not just for himself, but so that this would never happen to another American again. So it was a powerful statement, and we expected the judge to write an opinion, which judges usually do, Instead, the judge ruled from the bench, and she ruled in favor of us on all counts, that the incarceration of Japanese Americans was, uh, was wrong, it was unfair, that the decision to incarcerate Japanese Americans was influenced by the views of one military commander who, whose uh, perspective was infected by racism, and that had the court known the true set of facts, um, because they were suppressed, in fact, and that misconduct then led the courts to uphold Fred Korematsu's conviction. And based on that, she uh, overturned his conviction.